live from the United States where the press doesn't tell you the news, they sell you the news. This is hell. And because we are completely listener supported, we can have guests on like today's who will be discussing a part of history that is far too often overlooked, a part of history that is based on generalizations, vague understandings, and rumors. Here to help us have a better grasp of what the Black Panthers were, where they came from, what they stood for, what they believed, and the militancy they saw as the only way to liberation, we are always very happy to have on our show. Truly is an honor. Historian Gerald Horn returns to the show to discuss his new book, Armed Struggle, Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. First, Gerald, does it sound okay? So far, so good. All right. We'll see how this goes. So you start by taking us back to June 1971 in Algiers, then the site of the major international legation of the Black Panther Party headquartered in California. It was in Algeria where party leaders Kathleen Neal Cleaver and Donald Cox were to be found conferring with a diplomat from the embassy of then-socialist Czechoslovakia. The readout was explicit. The U.S. militants were seeking a cache of Model 61 automatic machine pistols, ideally suited to the conditions of our struggle in the urban areas also desired were silencers. These Panthers had been informed that the diplomats' government supported the liberation struggles of all peoples, so why not back that in the citadel of imperialism? So my question is, was this, because you, you point out how this was seen as a, a logical step from the inchoate uh, urban revolts. Indeed, the Panthers argued for a move from riots to armed struggle. Was this in reaction to what the Panthers and others saw as colonialism as a class project? That is something that benefited not all Americans, in fact, had victimized many Americans and ancestors and their ancestors that preceded them, but only the wealthy. Was What is missed in our understanding of colonialism when we do not see it as a class project, but something that was a benefit to everyone, including those who are not wealthy? Well, it's appropriate that you ask that question as we approach July 4th, 2024, the 248th anniversary of the founding of the United States of America. And as I pointed out in a previous book, The Counter Revolution of 1776, the founding of the United States in many ways was the formation of the first apartheid regime. That is to say, the Declaration of Independence was unsparing in its denunciation of the indigenous population and certainly uh, they were not covered by the Bill of Rights nor other laws. Uh, many of them did not become U.S. citizens until the early 1920s. And certainly the founding of the United States was not meant to cover the black population. Uh, Thomas Jefferson made that explicit and clear in its notes from the state of Virginia. And so when the Panthers materialized in Algiers in 1971, uh, seeking arms to foment class struggle and armed struggle, they were carrying forward this idea that black people in particular were an oppressed class and that the United States was designed to oppress them. In fact, Pew, P-E-W, you know, the foundation at Think Tank, just a few days ago did a study that was only covered, as far as I could tell, in the L.A. Times, not in the New York Times or Washington Post, which shows that a significant majority of black people feel that the United States was designed specifically to persecute and oppress them. Pew dismissed this as a so-called conspiracy theory, uh, that is to say, like thinking Elvis is still alive and still in the building. But of course, they received significant pushback from uh, black scholars or black activists in particular, because, of course, this majority, thinking that the United States was designed to oppress and persecute them, were on to something. You in Chicago should not be unfamiliar with this. I'm sure you recall what happened on December 4th, 1969, when Black Panther leaders, uh, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, were killed. Fred Hampton in his bed with his pregnant wife and Mark Clark sitting in a chair in the wee hours of the morning, uh, leading to lawsuits, uh, leading to investigations. And that was not atypical of how the Panthers were handled. Having said that, it's also fair to say that Los Angeles, Southern California in general, was probably the, the epicenter of the armed fist coming down on the heads of Panthers. 
many in your audience are familiar with the notorious Los Angeles Police Department. You're familiar with what happened to black motorist Rodney King a few decades ago when he his beating at the hands of actually the California Highway Patrol uh, were captured on tape in the L.A. metropolitan area of uh, leading police officers who, of course, did not uh, encounter justice, and that led, as you may recall, to an urban uprising, an inchoate urban uprising of the early 1990s. By then, the early 1990s, the Black Panthers were little more than a faint memory, and this was a direct result not only of persecution and oppression, dirty tricks, um, what happened to Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, folks being jailed, some folks still in jail, folks being driven into exile, for example, folks turned into snitches and other kinds of miscreants uh, targeting the uh, Black Panther Party. So it's, it's a very uh, troubling story that unfolds in this book now before us. You write how in 1952 that the leadership of the Communist Party of California were on trial in Los Angeles on charges of violating the notorious Smith Act, a prototypical thought crime, as you describe it, where the gravamen of the case was precisely their professing Marxism, Leninism, and Socialism. So just so people understand the Smith Act, how was the Smith Act a thought crime, or, in, or you know, uh, making thinking into a crime? Well, the prosecution basically involved the prosecutors dragging out dusty tones of Lenin and Marx and quoting them with regard to what they had to say about overthrowing capitalism and then imputing those words to the leaders of the Communist Party because, after all, they professed to be followers of the philosophies of Marx and Lenin although there were not necessarily overt acts connecting them to acts of violence. There were Smith Act prosecutions, not only in Los Angeles, not only in Chicago, but in New York, in scores of cities, including in Hawaii. Uh, I dealt with that in my previous book, Fighting in Paradise. And what happens is that these prosecutions not only hamstring, to put it euphemistically, the Communist Party, but it attempts to, in some ways, illegalize the idea of professing socialism. Having said that, uh, it's also fair to say that even though the U.S. Communist Party was hampered tremendously by the Smith Act prosecution, many of which did not end until the late 1950s, the Black Panther Party picked up that mantle. Uh, that is to say that if you look, for example, as I do, at Jonathan Jackson, a precocious teenager, the younger brother of George Jackson, who had been in prison, a field marshal of the Black Panther Party, Jonathan Jackson, as a high schooler in Pasadena, California, started a newspaper called Escra. Escra, of course, homage to a newspaper of the same name coming out of Bolshevik, Russia, more than a century ago. The Black Panthers, in their political education classes, of course, study the philosophies of Marx and Engels and Lenin, but also uh, those like C.L.R. James of Trinidad and Tobago, who wrote the book on the Haitian Revolution, Black Jacobins, of course, studying Eric Williams of Trinidad and Tobago in his still canonical text, uh, Capitalism and Slavery, and so what happens is that <clears throat> despite the hammering of the Communist Party and the attempt in many ways to illegalize the professing of socialism, uh, this had not deterred the Black Panther Party. But alas, what happens is that this inflames the U.S. authorities, uh, leading to the aforementioned persecution of the Black Panther Party. And then what happens subsequently? is that when the historians begin to tackle this important subject, oftentimes they elide or omit the socialist ideologies of the Black Panther Party and incorporate them under the rubric of, quote, black power. Now, 
it is not illogical to incorporate the Panthers under that particular rubric, but to wholly omit their professing of socialism, to wholly omit their attempt to reach out to socialist Cuba. As a matter of fact, as you probably know, Apple TV now has uh, an offering uh, concerning Huey P. Newton, a founder of the party, and his attempt to reach socialist Cuba when he was on the lam in the 1970s. As we speak, there are still former Panthers residing in socialist Cuba um, who have received uh, sanctuary there. Uh, you have Panthers who sought sanctuary in Tanzania when it was pursuing a path of non-capitalist development leading towards socialism. I could go on in this vein, but the larger and wider point is that a lot of this history, for various reasons, has been obscured, if not mangled. If not erased, if not made invisible, do you think that the the people who were trying to find refuge, who were trying to find sanctuary in Cuba, do you think that contributes contributes at all to this day to anti-Cuban lingering antagonism that it seems is bipartisan here in the United States? Granted, Barack Obama did lift some of the restrictions against Cuba, but those were taken away by Trump, and I don't believe the Biden administration has put those back in place from the from the Obama era. So do you think that, that, uh, that black militants looking for sanctuary in Cuba contributes to anti-Cuban bipartisan antagonism to this day? Absolutely. You need, need look no further than the woman we know as Asada Shakur, formerly known as Joanne Chesimar, who for years has now received sanctuary in social Cuba. Recall that former New Jersey Governor uh, Chris Christie, Republican, former presidential hopeful, put a bounty on her head, and there was a fear in Cuba that the U.S. paratroopers or the like would land seeking to kidnap her. Indeed, if you look at the Wall Street Journal this very morning, on the back page, you would see a scare article suggesting that China, the enemy of Europe, now has a number of spy bases in socialist Cuba. Uh, this brings back echoes and memories of the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, when the world came perilously close to nuclear warfare because of the allegation that the then Soviet Union had placed missiles in Cuba, it was said, to threaten the national security of the United States of America. In that context, the breakthrough under President Obama of going to Cuba and raising the hand of then-President uh, Raul Castro has been anomalous. Uh, since the triumph of the Cuban Revolution in 1959. And I think that one of the problems of the hawkish foreign policy of uh, President Joseph R. Biden has been his failure to carry through with the Obama policy concerning Cuba, but instead adopting in whole cloth the policy of his predecessor, Donald J. Trump. I assume in an attempt to win over the notoriously right-wing leaning Cuban-American population of South Florida, uh, which includes, I'm afraid to say, the U.S. Senator from New Jersey, Bob Menendez, now on trial, Gold Bar Bob, as he's called, because, you know, he puts gold bars in his closet, he says, because his parents, who are capitalists in Cuba, were expropriated, and therefore he doesn't trust banks. <laughs> so he's, he's still blaming uh, Cuba uh, for his uh, misdeeds and for his uh, prosecution. So, yes, it is, there is no doubt that the embrace of the Panthers by socialist Cuba uh, helped to foment and engineer uh, discord and persecution of Panthers and socialist Cuba alike. You write that it was in 1932 that the idea was brooded that the Young Communist League in Los Angeles should become, in the words of Communist leader Ben Dobbs, a semi-military organization, go out for military training, have uniforms, a response to, quote, fascist gangs that were arising in Germany. Again, this is 1932. 
was the movement that would eventually at least contribute to, if not lead to the creation of the Panthers, a reaction to rising fascism, not only in Europe, but here in the United States with the German Bund. Were they ahead of their time in denouncing global fascism in the United States? Well, I'm afraid to say that you're onto something. Uh, I've already made mention of the rampages of the LAPD. For example, uh, there was an armed conflict in December 1969 when the LAPD assaulted the Panther headquarters. There was talk about bringing tanks from further south uh, at the uh, Marine base south of Los Angeles to assault the Panther headquarters. Uh, going back to the 1930s, as you've done, I also mentioned that at that particular time, there was existent a communist international headquartered in Moscow. At that concern, at that time, there was great concern about the rise of fascism, not least in Spain, where you may recall that the fascists ultimately triumphed. As a result, you had the Communist International in Moscow training a communist from all over the world in various techniques of armed struggle. That, I'm afraid to say, came up during the aforementioned 1952 Smith Act trial in Los Angeles. But before then, in 1910, you had activists described as anarchists who blew up the L.A. Times building. The L.A. Times, back then, was a notorious right-wing rag, really a free fascist rag, and this was the response to their monitoring. And then, how can we forget the fact that during the bad old days of slavery, you had, in October 1859, the late, great John Brown, a Euro-American hero, particularly amongst black Americans. In fact, if you go to Haiti, you'll still find a broad boulevard named after John Brown. Uh, he led a hearty band in Western Virginia seeking to lead an armed uprising against slavery, but for his troubles, was captured by then U.S. military leader Robert E. Lee, who months later became the military leader of the so-called Confederate States of America, which sought to overthrow the United States because they wanted to perpetuate enslavery, uh, enslavement of Africans forevermore. And then how can we forget in this litany the late great Matt Turner, who in 1831, uh, once again in Virginia, uh, led an armed uprising against slavery. Of course, there was a Hollywood movie about him, uh, I think it was called uh, Birth of a Nation, not the cinematic travesty of more than a century ago, but actually, in retrospect, a, a, a very important film. And so this land, uh, this bloody land, to quote John Brown, oftentimes has seen armed struggle. Now, how can it be otherwise? Because how did the settlers get the land from the Native Americans? It was through the barrel of a gun. How were Africans kept enslaved? It was through the barrel of a gun. Why is there a Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which was designed to make sure that settlers were armed to confront rebellious Africans and marauding indigenous? It was, of course, because of the necessity and proceed to seize this land and to have free labor. So why should anyone be shocked? that in the 1960s, given that bloody history, that the Panthers and others would decide to, as the saying went at the time, pick up the gun. And the origins of policing here in the United States being involved, being uh, slave patrols. But, you know, what, what we're told, Gerald, and you've heard this a million times, Kanye West even made a point of saying this, that there were no uprisings during U.S. slavery, during slavery in the Confederacy and the American South. There were no uprisings happening. How much does that kind of thinking, the erasure of people like John Brown, of people like Nat Turner, how much does that lead to any... It perceived delegitimization of the Black Panthers' armed struggle for liberation. How much does that misperception of our past lead to a lack of understanding the context of what the Black Panther Party would become? Well, it has everything to, to do with that. And, of course, it's not accidental, because 
I'm sure you kept close tabs on the recent Supreme Court decision of the last 24 hours, which in many ways seeks to provide the what is thought to be the incoming U.S. President, Donald J. Trump, with what could easily be considered dictatorial power, uh, powers, as Justice Sotomayor of Puerto Rican ancestry put it in her dissenting opinion, uh, theoretically, potentially, it could authorize Donald J. Trump to get Navy SEALs to assassinate uh, political rivals or political dissidents, uh, for that matter, uh, without running afoul of the law. Now, if that grim scenario takes place, uh, once again, I'm afraid to say that the idea of armed struggle might arise. And there are those, as they say in Washington, on both sides of the aisle, uh, who would like to forestall that possibility. But I'm happy to report the good news, which is that one of the reasons you've had so many attacks on universities of late is precisely because you have a number of scholars, not necessarily radical scholars, but honest scholars, who are seeking to reveal and uncover the history uh, that we are now discussing. For example, uh, I do interviews myself on Pacifica Radio, and just last week, I interviewed a scholar, actually from Northwestern University, believe it or not, who just wrote a very important article on the enslaved use of arson, for example, including seeking to burn down the Confederate White House in the 1860s, including seeking to burn down the house of Martha Washington, widow of the founder, George Washington, in an attempt to escape her wrath, an attempt to use arson to assassinate the slave-owning senator from South Carolina, John C. Calhoun, a proud alumnus of Yale University. Now, to many, the revelations of this scholar in the December 2023 Journal of American History came as a revelation, as a bolt from the blue. But if you think about it for more than a nanosecond, and if you think about the recent history of the Black Panther Party, you will see that it's obvious that the enslaved Africans were not uh, lightly accepting their fate. Uh, they were using every means necessary to escape their dire fate, and that's certainly the legacy bequeathed to the heroic Black Panther Party. But this, as you and I have discussed before, this is the kind of history that the right, that uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, that they want to censor from any kind of curriculum. You write that when it comes to the Panthers and communists, I have found that it is difficult to comprehend the former without contemplating the latter. What happens to our understanding, understanding of the Black Panthers when that context of communism is either dismissed, ignored, or in other ways not considered? What do we miss in our understanding of what the Black Panthers would become when we dismiss the idea of any context or influence from communism? Well, I think what it leads to is a miscomprehension and a misunderstanding of the politics of the United States in the first instance. For example, myself and other scholars have suggested that in order to understand the abolition of slavery, you have to understand the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, which ignited a general crisis of the entire slave system in the Americas that could only be resolved with its collapse. And not least in the United States of America, of course, the successful revolutionaries in Haiti uh, helped to foment slave uprising, not only throughout the uh, Caribbean, but also in the North American mainland. In order to understand the retreat of U.S. apartheid, uh, speaking of Jim Crow, as myself and other historians have pointed out, you have to understand the rise of a socialist camp and their aid to national liberation movements, not least in the Caribbean and Africa, and how this created a dilemma for Uncle Sam because the United States was seeking to cultivate uh, hearts and minds in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, found it difficult to do so as African and Caribbean nations were coming to independence, given the fact that they have a storehouse of natural resources that Uncle Sam wanted to get his grubby little paws on. And so that creates a dynamic that leads in 1954 to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, saying, you know what, Jim Crow U.S. apartheid is unconstitutional. Uh, that leads us to today, where we're still facing dire problems, not least uh, police terror directed against black communities, but that pre-existing uh, global context of the rising socialist camp aiding national liberation movements is hardly prevalent today, which of course has led directly to an increase in police terror, 
And unless we understand that pre-existing context, we can understand what's, hap what's happening today. Uh, for example, it's interesting to note that the U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice in 1954, at the time of this uh, decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, was Earl Warren, the former governor of California, Republican, who, as I talk about in the book, presides over the internment of U.S. nationals of Japanese ancestry between 1942 and 1945 uh, because it's thought that they were inherently pro-Tokyo. Of course, uh, U.S. nationals of German and Italian ancestry were not necessarily treated similarly. And in order to understand how Earl Warren becomes this avatar of civil liberties, supposedly in 1954, while presiding over one of the grossest violations of civil liberties in the history of the United States, which is saying something, in 1943, you have to understand this global context. It really does a disservice to history, a disservice to reality, to try to understand the United States absent a global context, and certainly it does a disservice to the history of the Black Panther Party. You write that the White House was dis uh, was displeased when news emerged from Algiers, the news that I was talking about earlier, that the Panthers were in a close relationship with Palestinian militants. Eldridge Cleaver, a, quote, close friend of the Fatah representative in Algeria, being the principal point of contact. The bumptious Cleaver was spotted addressing a Fatah confab, and Premier Leader Yasser Arafat appeared in public with him and had offered to train Panther members at its bases in Jordan. Cleaver was invited there for an inspection tour. By August 1974, Panthers arranged to spend a month observing operations there with the Palestinians hoping to develop blacks in the U.S. as a propaganda base. The loose-lipped Cleaver informed the world that our party also has underground aspects. There are some Black Panther members no one knows about. The Los Angeles leader, Geronimo, a Vietnam veteran, and he went on. So did the Panthers view, and I assume that they did, and they still do, uh, did, did they view U.S. police as an occupying force as the Palestinians viewed Israel? And is there a lingering legacy of Palestinian support within the African-American community dating back to the Black Panthers? Has that left a mark on African-American politics in general? Well, absolutely. Uh, you need look no further than the recent defeat in the primaries in New York State just a few days ago, a Congressional Black Caucus member, Congressman Jamal Bowman of Bronx Westchester, who has been quite vocal and forthright in calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, the Israeli lobby spent an inordinate sum to make sure that he would be defeated in his primary, which happened. They now have, in the crosshairs, Cori Bush, another Congressional Black Caucus member, she from St. Louis, who's spoken out in similar words and verbiage with regard to Gaza. Uh, I dare say that uh, probably Andre Carson, of your neighbor in Indiana, who happens to be a Muslim, will also be in the crosshairs, although it will be very difficult to beat him since he has a base of support in Gary, Indiana. They failed, speaking of the Israeli lobby, in defeating CBC member, Congressional Black Caucus, Caucus member Summer Lee of Western Pennsylvania and primaries uh, in that state, in the Keystone State, uh, just a few weeks ago. So certainly there is a lingering legacy of Panther, excuse me, Black American Palestinian solidarity, with the Panthers being just one more chapter in this story. Recall as well that the leader we once knew as Stokely Carmichael, later as Kwame Touré, was also part of this legacy, as was the organization he once led, speaking of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the shock troops of the anti-Jim Crow movement. However, to be fair, I should also mention that uh, there are those today, uh, for example, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of Brooklyn, the so-called speaker-in-waiting, Mayor Eric Adams of New York City, uh, Reverend L. Sharpton of New York City, uh, who have contradicted that legacy that I've just outlined. But I should also mention that the Panthers were not only in solidarity with the Palestinians, they also offered to send brigades to North Vietnam to fight alongside the Vietnamese as they were struggling against U.S. imperialism. 
basis delegations to North Korea. For example, the aforementioned Kathleen Cleaver, who was negotiating with the Czechs in Algiers in 1971, which begins my book, uh, her daughter, as I recall, who is now in exile in Tanzania, Southeast Africa, was actually born in North Korea uh, as they, she and Elders Cleaver were visiting them. So part of the extirpated legacy of the Panthers has been internationalism. And it's striking to note that despite the heroism of Jamal Bowman, Corey Bush, Summer Lee, Andre Carson, I'm afraid to say that with regard to some of our mass organizations that are still with us, including the NAACP, which you may know plays a huge role in this book, they abandon the internationalist barricade. And given the fact that they're the largest mass organization in black America, uh, this has had a powerfully negative impact on our struggle because as noted by my reference to the Haitian Revolution, helping to lead to the abandonment of slavery, the rise of socialist nations and national liberation movements, impacting the abandonment or the erosion, I should say, of Jim Crow. One of the reasons why these malign and malignant forces now seem to be on the march today is because we, that is to say many of our organizations like the NAACP, have not lengthened the battlefield which is the central lesson of progress, not only for black Americans, but I would say for progressive movements generally in North America. You mentioned Black Panther Sekou Odinga. According to his comrade Donald Cox, he served as an international diplomat where he was based, when he was based in Algeria. People from Algiers to Cairo, Beirut, Kuwait, and all the way to the Cape in South Africa that either knew or heard of Sekou, especially when he was welcoming Oliver Tambo, Nelson Mandela's closest comrade to Algiers, or being photographed alongside Yasser Arafat, Palestinian leader. So were the Panthers seen as a threat, not just to potentially capitalism, being communist, but were they seen as a threat to ongoing U.S. colonialism and imperialism? Were they in any respect rising up against many of the exact same issues that students occupying campuses were the spring and the encampments that still exist today and what is missed when we do not see the panthers as an uprising against imperialism and colonialism that long predated the actions against genocide in gaza today well the short answer to your intelligent intelligent question is obviously yes and i'm glad you mentioned the student encampments because one of the many assets and merits of these heroic students is that they help to alter the vocabulary. Because of these student activists, we now have to confront the term settler colonialism. They've applied it to historic Palestine. Of course, we could apply it to North America. We also can look at the offshoots of settler colonialism that the Panthers spoke about, such as, quote, internal colonialism, because many of the Panthers saw black Americans as being analogous to Palestinians, being analogous to Africans under apartheid pre-1994, and therefore they saw it as their obligation to reach across the oceans and across the borders and link hands uh, with these folks. And yes, there is no doubt that the U.S. authorities saw this as a threat to U.S. national security, and as a result, they put enormous pressure on the Algerians because Algiers then, as now, was a major repository of natural gas. Natural gas, of course, has played a role in terms of the war in Ukraine. It's playing a role with regard to politics in both Texas and Louisiana, as we speak. And certainly, it played a role in terms of the machinations of the then Nixon administration when it was trying to woo the Algerians away from their concord uh, with the Black Panther Party. And I'm afraid to say that the Nixon administration was not uh, necessarily unsuccessful in that regard. But once again, that bespeaks the farsightedness uh, of many of the Panther leaders, including 
the late Sekou Odinga recalled that he only passed away quite recently after spending a stint in prison, as has been the case, I'm afraid to say, for uh, many uh, Panther leaders. As noted, many were wound up in prison, many wound up in exile in Cuba and elsewhere, and of course many, like Fred Hampton and Mark Clark of Chicago, wound up six feet under. So you, uh, well, first of all, we are speaking with historian Gerald Horn, who returns to the show to discuss his new book, Armed Struggle, Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. You can go to our website, thisishell.com, and search on his name, Horn, H-O-R-N-E, and find all of our interviews with Gerald absolutely free. So you write, of, you give some of your own history, writing, I first visited Berkeley in 1969 for an anti-fascist conference sponsored by the Panthers and then returned in 1970 as a law student at the sprawling University of California campus. I worked alongside the Panthers, read their well-circulated newspaper regularly, Co collaborated with them on various projects, taught them at the prison at Vacaville, due north of the campus. Then I lent my prized copy of Friedrich Engels' The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State to an inmate then known as Donald DeFries, who never returned it. He perished in May of 1974 during the midst of a shootout between his Symbionese Liberation Army and the authorities. I knew Steve Weed from Princeton, the fiancé of heiress Patty Hearst, whom the SLA kidnapped and allegedly brainwashed. I was present when the young scholar Angela Davis was a celebratory party, or had a celebratory party, making, marking her acquittal in 1972 on criminal charges that could have meant the death penalty. I knew her attorney, Howard Moore, and was a classmate of his spouse, Jane Bond Moore. Consonant with the zeitgeist, it was while residing in Berkeley that I became familiar with shotguns, including skeet shooting, though I had not picked up a gun previously and never did again after departing California. Was there any sense within that movement, uh, movement at that time, at that moment, was there any sense of dread about police or government blowback and the possibility the movement would be short-lived, squelched by the state? Was there any sense that it was only a matter of time, that it was inevitable, that the state would strike back to the point of threatening, if not ending, that movement? I'm afraid so. And uh, I think, in a, in a sense, we have to give the prophecy, because that is precisely what happened. I should say on the other side of the equation that one of the reasons I wrote this book, because I'm afraid to say that armed struggle uh, might be in the future of many of our younger comrades, particularly, as noted, given this movement towards the ultra-right as enunciated by the U.S. Supreme Court and providing dictatorial powers to what they see as the incoming U.S. president, speaking of one Donald J. Trump. And so what I'm trying to do, in part in this book, is provide a blueprint in part of what not to do. I mean, for example, I, I think that the Panthers could have been better diplomats, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, many of the Panthers, or some of the Panthers, I should say, uh, alienated their host in socialist Cuba, for example. Uh, some of the Panthers uh, alienated their host in Algeria at a time when they were the guests of the state. I also mentioned early on that before launching armed struggle, there should be a comprehensive study of the battlefield, assessing the strengths and weaknesses of the enemy across the barricades. And if the decision is made with regard to launching armed struggle, you don't necessarily have to broadcast that. Uh, you, you quote a, uh, my reference to Cleaver being loose-lipped, uh, which I think is a reference to broadcasting prematurely of what your side is planning to do. Recall that I've talked about how uh, many uh, communists were trained in the techniques of guerrilla warfare in Moscow in the 1930s. Um, they did not necessarily come back from Moscow blabbing about that <laughs> to the newspapers or even to other comrades, for example. So, once again, I think this book is not only trying to uncover an obscured, if not disappeared history, but also trying to provide a road map as to what not to do if this historic moment of seeking to combat fierce repression reappears. 
I like that. It's not as much a how-to. It is a how-to, but it's also very much a how-not-to. You point out that, understandably, the Panthers have been viewed retrospectively by some as an emblem of the black power trend which emerged as Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale founders were uh, catapulted into prominence. More precisely, the Panthers were a halfway house between black power and the then-tormented Communist Party, an ally of the soon-to-be-extinguished Soviet Union. In an anticipatory rebuke of 21st century scholars, Black Party Panther or Black Panther Party leaders Masai Hewitt and Eldridge Cleaver were asked, you are being lumped together with the various cultural nationalists, the Leroy Joneses, the Karengas, the Muslims, and Cleaver responded contemptuously, for a black man, it is far more important to read Marx rather than learn Swahili. Now, I'm not too sure if this is the right phrasing, but is African nationalism, if you will, allowed by liberals, even celebrated as a distraction from the class project that is targeting African Americans, is celebrating African culture by, say, kneeling in a kente cloth aloud, but rising up against racialized police violence and capitalist exploitation? Does that cross the line for liberals? Well, I, I put it a different way. I would say that going back to the text, there was a bitter and internecine struggle uh, in Los Angeles, in Southern California, between forces surrounding the man who's still with us today, speaking of Milana Karenga, a founder of Kwanzaa, a black American holiday celebrated at the end of the year, uh, at the end of 2024, for example. And uh, I think it's also fair to say, as my book concludes, that Karenga's forces were manipulated against the Black Panther Party, not least in January 1969, when there was a shootout on the UCLA campus leading a couple of Panther leaders in L.A. dead, stone cold dead, uh, speaking of uh, John Huggins and Bunchy Carter. Having said that, uh, perhaps because we tried to evolve, I think it's fair to say that uh, there's nothing necessarily negative about learning Swahili. As a matter of fact, I think I, I go on to say uh, in that same paragraph that uh, George Jackson, one of the Panther stalwarts, uh, studied foreign languages. Um, many uh, militants today uh, try to move away from the monolingualism that characterized the United States of America by studying Arabic, which is spoken over a good deal of West Asia and North Africa in particular. Uh, Swahili has become a lingua franca of uh, East Africa, Tanzania, Kenya, given the fact that Tanzania has become a kind of headquarters for uh, black American exiles, obviously, including panthers, by the way, and uh, panther cubs, as they're called, that is to say descendants of the panthers. Uh, obviously, uh, studying Swahili uh, could have been uh, worthwhile before they landed in Dar es Salaam. So it, it, it's, it's very complicated, although I do think it's fair to say that there were many liberals who were not comfortable, <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, with the Panthers and were more comfortable uh, with the black nationalists as embodied by Mr. Karenga, who, as I said, is still in the land of the living in his 80s, uh, for example, has lived a long and bountiful life. And I would like to think has evolved beyond some of his uh, more untoward projects of the late 1960s. But uh, you'll have to ask him about that. So why was the Black Panther Party opposed to black power? What does that tell us about both the idea of black power as well as the philosophies of the Black Panthers, that the Black Panthers were opposed to black power? Well, I would say it was the particular iteration of black power that was then being embodied and enunciated, not least by Karenga and his forces, uh, which as they saw it, uh, tended to downplay the struggle for socialism, as they saw it, uh, tended to involve conciliation uh, with the U.S. ruling class. For example, there's a story that Karenga has sought to refute that suggested that during a moment of tenseness in Los Angeles, and there were many moments of tenseness in Los Angeles during this era, uh, he had a sit-down. But then California governor, Ronald Wilson Reagan, uh, for example, he was uh, prominently featured in the Wall Street Journal and other publications, uh, for example. So I think it was a particular iteration of black 
power that the Panthers objected to. At least that's my reading of history. You mentioned the destabilization and dirty tricks campaign of the FBI, COINTELPRO, which wounded not only the Panthers, but also the mainstream civil rights movement. Yet, according to uh, Communist Party counsel John Abt, his client, William Schneiderman, the lead defendant in the L.A. trial, that's the Smith Act trials, was the target of 1,388 of 2,370 official acts of this program. And the authorities' crusade lasted longest 15 years against them from about 1956 to 1971. A purpose was to invalidate Marxism as a mode of thought or minimally force a retreat of the ideology and compel doubters of the alleged munificence of capitalism to profess liberalism instead. This was not altogether unsuccessful. Did the FBI successfully silence Marxists, seeing them as a threat to capitalism? And does that explain why the FBI does not see, seem to be as concerned about, say, fascism? Because it is, <laughs> to some degree, compatible with capitalism. That's the understatement of the decade. And I should also <laughs> mention that in this book, in addition to telling the story about the Panthers, in addition to telling the story about black nationalists like Karenga, in addition to telling a story about the Communist Party, I also have a number of points I seek to make about the Jewish American community. Because going back to the 1940s in particular, the L.A. Communist Party was disproportionately comprised of Jewish Americans. The U.S. ruling class saw this as a strategic problem to be addressed. And I think I said in the book that if you look at U.S. imperialist policy towards Central America during the same era, which was encapsulated in the phrase frijoles y fusiles, beans and rifles, that is to say, concessions on the one hand and repression on the other, well, that's precisely how the U.S. ruling class approached the Jewish American community. Repression, June 1953, Jewish American communists, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, executed. Why? Because of alleged, purported, supposed leaking on their part of the supposed, alleged, purported secret of atomic weapons from Moscow. And then, of course, there were concessions. These vaunted Ivy League institutions and schools like Northwestern, for example, for decades they had pursued the anti-Jewish quotas, limiting their admission to these institutions. These anti-Jewish quotas were eroded, shall we say, allowing for the ascension of many Jewish Americans on the class ladder allowing them to enter the professions, dentistry, medicine, accounting, law, the academy, for example. And then simultaneously, uh, you saw the many on the left uh, beginning to uh, flock towards Israel. And it's interesting, just as a footnote, uh, many of our friends on the left, they oftentimes use this term identity politics to, uh, to describe as a descriptor for various wings of the black liberation movement. I've never heard anybody in the United States describe Israel as an identity politics state, even though it's a state based upon a narrow ethno-religious identity. And so that particular maneuver was not altogether unsuccessful because Israel becomes unsinkable aircraft carrier for U.S. imperialism in West Asia. Uh, as noted, it becomes a bone of contention with the Black Liberation Movement. Uh, recall my remarks about uh, Seku Odinga and their huddling with Yasser Arafat, for example. Uh, this helps to undergird a real Black Jewish rift, which has not disappeared. Recall my words about Jamal Bowman, for example, recently defeated in a New York State Congressional primary. And so, uh, this is another story that I tell in this book, and this is a story that we need more research and writing about. You mentioned uh, in Palm Springs by the 1950s, this desert hideaway for the stars was yet to attain the preeminence it was to accrue soon afterwards. This transformation occurred as the result of what was described officially as a 
city-engineered holocaust as Negroes, who then occupied prime downtown land, were ousted without proper notice or relocation. Cruelly, many of these workers had gone to work in the morning, but found upon returning in the evening their homes in ashes. As many as 2,000 families were burned out, robbing them of generational wealth. Poignantly, one victim moaned that this dog came running across the street, the dog was on fire, and the house burned up too. Again, these are not the kind of moments that we are taught in history classes around the United States. So it's unsurprising for Americans to not realize or recognize the reasons for these, for their eventually uh, ra uh, racialized police violence, uh, the uprisings against that. Is our understanding of not only the Black Panther Party, but racism more generally, uninformed about our racist history, and is it just only a matter of informing the public, or is our misunderstanding due to more than only being mis- or uninformed? Well, that last question goes back to a debate uh, fomented in no small measure by the late, great W.E.B. Du Bois, a black American who was a founder of Pan-Africanism, a founder of NAACP, joined the U.S. Communist Party in 1961 before decamping to West Africa, Ghana, and self-imposed exile where he died in 1963 as the march on Washington was stepping off. And recall that early in his career, uh, he, he thought that the issue was ignorance. And so if he could only write books and do investigations helping to alleviate this ignorance, that this problem of white supremacy and racism could begin to erode. I think in the cold light of history, we can say, yes, these kinds of investigations are necessary or mandatory or needed or required, but they're not enough because the ignorance is not necessarily accidental. It flows inexorably, inevitably, and reluctantly from a certain kind of socioeconomic system that depends for its operation on a disproportionate percentage of the population being misled. I mean, for example, if you look at the uh, recent elections in France, for example, you'll see that the neo-fascists uh, did quite well. And what's interesting comparing the right wing in France and the United States is that in France, the right wing fundamentally says we're going to keep social welfare programs, but we're just not going to extend them to uh, French folk of Arab or Muslim ancestry or recent immigrants. Whereas in the United States, uh, the descendants of the settlers, uh, a disproportionate percentage of the Euro-American population, they're willing to vote for Trump, whose operations inevitably are going to lead to a weakening of social welfare programs. You, you have to believe that either A, as many of our friends on the left say, they misread their own class interests, or more darkly, that like black people in pre-1994 apartheid South Africa, they're willing to take the hit with regard to penalties delivered by sanctions because they see over the rainbow as a brighter future. That is to say, that if you look at the history of the United States, at one time, uh, the settlers benefited handsomely from depredations inflicted upon the indigenous. I mean, I, I tell the story, as you know, in my Texas book about the ouster of the Cherokees from the southeast quadrant of the United States of America. And many of the Cherokees had become slave owners. Many of them had become involved in sedentary agriculture. Uh, many of them had become Christians. They had a written language. They published newspapers, which I drew upon from my study. They still had to go. And European migrants, right off the boat, were able to move into their mansions. And so when you have people on the left who celebrate the early history of the United States, unwittingly, perhaps as, as evidenced by July 4th, 2024, they are celebrating ethnic cleansing. They're celebrating indigenous dispossession. They're celebrating the disproportionate uh, enrichment of settlers and settler descendants who seem, for some reasons, tend to think that if they 
are able to put a dictator in the Oval Office with all restraints removed, per the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision, then the path can be clear for a return to these alleged halcyon days when supposedly the United States was great and they're not they're going to make the United States great again. Gerald, one last question for you. We've been speaking with Gerald Horn, who has returned to the show to discuss his new book, Armed Struggle, Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. And i got to tell you, I have about 45 more questions for you. We could be doing this for another three hours. I would, I would absolutely enjoy that, but unfortunately, we're up against the clock. So as you know, our final question for each and every one of our guests is what we call the question from hell, the question we hate to ask, you may hate to answer, our audience is going to hate your response. How dependent is the status quo in the United States on denialism of our racist, our settler colonial past? How dependent is the success of the Trump campaign? How dependent are they on a denialism, a willful ignorance of the United States past? Well, the bad news is is that There's something to what your question embeds. That is to say that, yes, there is denialism. But to return to a point I rooted a few moments ago, the good news is that you have a number of honest historians who are excavating this past. Uh, I've mentioned them in a number of podcasts recently. They should be easy to discover with a little searching and a little digging. And that's one of the reasons why history and historiography has become a battlefield. That's one of the reasons why in Texas and in Florida in particular, you see school librarians being persecuted, harassed, and fired, school principals, school teachers. Uh, This is not happening uh, by accident or by happenstance. It's happening because you have a number of courageous people in this country who are pushing back against denialism. And I would like to think that with some expert strategizing, particularly involving the lessons from the past, which include lengthening the battlefield, reaching across the borders, reaching across the oceans to the like-minded, that we'll be able to prevail. But right now, I would say that the prospects are merely 50-50. Just to follow up on that real quick, uh, so are liberals also uh, willfully ignorant of that past? Are they also embracing, and to any degree, a denialism of that past? Well, for sure. And, and, and I think of this particularly in terms of how liberals deal with the, those to their left. Uh, they tr- you, you rarely on MSNBC see anyone to the left of liberalism uh, with regard to liberal pundits and opinion columnists, they rarely mention the plethora of ideas coming from those to the left of liberalism. I think that they're still observing the dictates of the Red Scare, what we talked about a few moments ago in terms of the attempt to legalize socialism and to make Marxism off limits. Somebody needs to tell these people that the Cold War I think it's fair to say, probably ended in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and so it's time to move away from that moth back thinking. But I think that in addition to being ignorant, speaking of some of our erstwhile liberal friends, I think that they feel that if they begin to embrace those to their left, that those to their left might assume hegemony in the movement, which is probably true, and that at the same time, they will be, that is to say, the liberals will then be further harassed by the conservatives. Recall that one of the hate terms used by Mr. Trump precisely is Marxist and socialist, for example. And so there is the dilemma. I mean, look at the response to the Supreme Court decision yesterday. You have all of these liberal lawyers saying, oh, you know, we need to amend the Constitution. Just like you can snap your fingers and amend the Constitution. Just like there's not a 75 million strong Trump base overrepresented in the halls of Congress, which will object. Or they say, oh, you know, we need to lengthen the terms of Supreme Court justices. Yeah, sure. I mean, as if they forgot that given the current rules, you need 60 votes in the Senate to do anything meaningful. Or uh, they'll say we need to end the filibuster. Oh, sure. Uh, 
right now the polls suggest that the Republicans are about to take take control of the U.S. Senate as soon as November. And what they do not engage is the political struggle, as opposed to this legal tinker, uh, tinkering with various constitutional amendments and various laws. What about the political struggle? What about going door to door, knocking on people's door, trying to influence them politically? I mean, there is the wherewithal to do that sort of thing. But again, I think that some of the liberals feel that if they go down that path, it'll lead to their being ousted uh, from ideological hegemony in the movement and political leadership in the movement. And so instead, they're going to run the risk of fascism. And as I've said uh, archly in the recent past, we have a lot of time to discuss and debate these issues in the concentration camps. <laughs> wow. Gerald, now our listeners know, if they didn't know it already, why you are one of our very, very, very favorite guests on our show, why you continually, why our listeners continually, year after year after year, suggest that we replay your interviews at the end of the year during our Best of This Is Hell series. Gerald, it is always a pleasure. And whenever you have anything out that you want to talk about, feel free to contact me. Really looking forward to talking to you again. Enjoy your upcoming weekend, and thank you so much for being back on our show. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Take care, Gerald. You've been listening to a This Is Hell interview. For more interview hell and to support the show, visit thisishell.com. <laughs>